going to title this today, How to Overcome Anxiety. How to Overcome Anxiety. That's going to be the title of today's message, How to Overcome Anxiety. So I'll read from Proverbs 17, verse 22, from the Easy Bible. Proverbs 17, verse 22, the Easy Bible. So the Bible says, if you are happy in life, you will be healthy. But if you are sad and upset, your body will be weak. If you are happy in life, you will be healthy. But if you are sad and upset, your body will be weak. So um, one of the things we see happening around us every now and then is that we see a lot of people who are not happy. They are dissatisfied with life, dissatisfied with their marriage, dissatisfied with their career, dissatisfied with everything, you know. So um, you could literally see outbursts of anger every day on the streets. You could tell that things are not going well with people. A lot of people are not happy, and that's a simple truth, but God wants us to be happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wants us to be happy. So um, uh, there was this uh, data we, we could get um, um, from World Bank, um, they released something 2021-2020, um, uh, okay, so uh, they released this data and they said that about, about 1 billion people on the earth um, uh, live with some form of mental disorders, 1 billion people on the earth, that's about 1 in 8 persons, so 1 out of 8 persons that you meet on the street has some form of mental disorders and, and you know the shocking thing is that in low income countries about uh, more than 75% of this number uh, do not even receive any form of treatment. So you can imagine the kind of, of maniac displays you see um, in some parts of the world because people never even consider going for any form of, of aid or getting any form of help. You know, and some people even believe that uh, mental disorders are diseases of the rich. So uh, they believe that, oh, it's a luxury disease. Uh, how can a poor man uh, be, be sick up there? You can't be sick up there. Maybe when a poor man is sick, he, he has headache or he has back pain, uh, but, but then he cannot have anything that has to do with mental health. So some people believe that it's a luxury disease, so they would never even consider seeking help. All right. So, and because of this, we see a lot of people having to resolve um, to substances uh, just to help them um, to maintain some, some sense of sanity. And, and we also see that close to 3 million people die every year due to substance abuse. About 3 million people die every year due to substance abuse. And um, uh, very close to that is also uh, the fact that every 40 seconds, a person dies by suicide. That's about 800,000 deaths annually by suicide alone. Every 40 seconds, someone is taking their own life. Someone is ending their own lives every 40 seconds. Just to let us know how, how, how grievous uh, this, uh, this issue of mental health is and why we should pay attention to it. So every 40 seconds, someone you know or someone close to you or someone that knows someone that you know is ending their own life. And the shocking thing also is that about 50% of mental health disorders start by the age of 14. So we see a whole lot of teenagers today breaking down. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I've heard uh, uh, people say things like, uh, when you see a teenager breaking down, someone say, ah, what's he thinking at, at that age? You know, because we look at ourselves when we're teenagers, the only thing we wanted to do was probably play football, um, you know, run around the street and all of that. But then you wonder, so a teenager in this age and time, what is he thinking? Uh, you know, wh what kind of problem does he even have? You don't have a problem, you're not paying no bills. So, uh, but, but the truth is, it's, it's the reality. 50% of mental disorders start at age 14. 
So um, there's another one I want us to pay attention to, which um, actually um, gave the the, uh, the topic for today how to overcome anxiety. So um, in 2019, the World Health Organization um, also did their own survey, and they came up uh, with six of uh, uh, the most uh, uh, the top most mental health disorders, and that we also need to pay attention to. And the first one they came up with was anxiety disorder. That's the first one. Anxiety disorder affects more than 301 million people annually more than 301 million people and out of these 301 million about 58 million of them are actually children 58 million living with anxiety disorders 58 million and the close the one close to it is depression depression affects about 280 million people globally 280 million people and the next to it is bipolar disorder, which are and, and also disruptive behavior. Each of them affect about 40 million people, and schizophrenia, which affects about 24 million people. And of course, the one they couldn't get data for because it is just rampant and then keep uh, springing up from all over the world is PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, which is uh, because of the wars and killings and things happening simultaneously everywhere. People going through a lot of traumatic situations, stress and all of that is just rampant. The whole thing is, is just taking away people's minds and, and people can, so, so I, I remember I had, um, I had this kind of episode uh, um, um, sometime, um, that was in um, October 2020, many of us can relate with it, you know, uh, uh, I, for some time I was just wondering, so uh, did it actually happen, were people killed, were people not killed, you know, it, it was something so, so, you know, that came to our mind, you know, and you can imagine that some people live in this kind of, uh, of situation situation where they are displaced um, from, their, from their homes, where um, they lost their farms, lost their businesses, lost their properties, lost everything that they have, and that is their own experience every day. So you can't even know the exact uh, the number of people that are affected every day by PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress disorders, rampant everywhere, abuses everywhere. So these things are real, they are with us here. So one in eight person that you meet on the street is living with a mental um, um, situation, a mental issue. So one in eight person that you meet. So um, what are some of the signs you need to watch out for in case you have anxiety? How do you even know? Of course, we're still going to talk on some things, the biblical way to eat, but I'll just use this to lay my foundation. One of the things you see is that there's excessive fear and worry and other related uh, behavioral disturbances. There's just fear and worry. You can't place it. Uh, yes, it's normal to have fear sometimes. Um, uh, maybe you want to do something that you have never done before, uh, you know, but experts say that when that excessive fear becomes a normal way of life and is extending to about six months, then it is a disorder. Yes, um, you, you want to probably meet somebody you've never met before. It's okay for you uh, to be afraid. You want to go to somewhere uh, you've never been before. You want to do something you've never done before. It's okay once in a while to have that fear or worry of, of what, what will happen. But when that fear consistently begins to paralyze you, begins to stop you from doing the things you are supposed to do, then that means that you are suffering um, uh, from a from anxiety disorder all right so another one is significant distress or impairment in functioning when you can no longer do the things you're supposed to do and irritability feeling of frustration or anger often over seemingly small matters so you see people any small thing they just they just flare up they just throw up sometimes it could be signs of um, of anxiety disorders also physical restlessness or a sense of being on the edge Physical restlessness, you are just always active, hyperactivity, a sense of dread, doom, or panic when somebody is always expecting that something bad will happen, something evil will happen, and that thing really um, it shocks you. It, it's, it's just there, living with you, like you, you are seeing doom next, next to you. You know, it's just a sign that something is wrong somewhere. For other people, it's brain fog. You see, um, uh, brain fog, difficulty in concentrating. You can't remember things. 
is they ask you uh, to go and do something and the next moment you've even forgotten um, uh, what, what we are supposed to do, uh, um, you know, so those are signs, you know, uh, physical and mental exhaustion, those are signs, um, some, for, for some people it's aches and pains, you know, stomach issues, you can't even trace it, so you go to the, to the hospital, they test you or maybe you have, um, you, you, you took some, uh, some poisonous substances and then they tell you that there's nothing wrong with you because some people don't even know how to diagnose these things. Some people don't even know how to diagnose them. So, so having established all this data, so the question is, what is the Bible's stand concerning this? And what provision do we have in the Bible for us to overcome anxiety? What principles do we have to live free of anxiety? So I'll be sharing with us five principles today on how you can live free of anxiety. So five principles. So the first principle I will talk about is purpose purpose. That's the first principle. And that answers the question why. The question why. Why do you think the way you do? Why do you feel what you feel? Why do you do what you do? Why, 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 why? You know, it's important that as a believer, as a Christian, you are able to ask yourself, why am I feeling this way? Remember in, in Psalm 42, uh, um, uh, there was a time David was talking to himself and he said, why are you downcast, oh my soul? He said, why are you disquieted within me? Uh, you know, one of the, one of the ways or, or the first step for you to be able to even become free is that you even understand that there's a problem in the first place. So David caught himself being disturbed. He said, why are you disquieted within me? He understood himself. So why? The first question is why? So why do you do what you do? Why do you want to become like that person? Why are you doing what every other person is doing? Why do you want to go to where every other person is going? Those are questions you need to be able to answer as a person. Why do you do the things that you do? What is the root of, uh, you know, why is that thought coming to you? So um, um, let, let's take um, some, some one, one or two uh, Bible passages, um, you know, to help us establish this, um, the, why purpose is very important. So I'll read Proverbs 29, verse 18, the Passion Translation. Proverbs 29, verse 18, the Passion Translation. So the Bible says, when there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. When there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. So one of the, uh, what happens when we have purpose, uh, when, when God has shown us uh, why we should be where we are, uh, or what we, why we do what we do, when God gives us revelation. One of the things that happens is that there is clarity. There is clarity. Then you know. So the Bible says where there is no clear prophetic vision. So many times people will live in anxiety because there is no clarity. There is no purpose. They just see, oh, everybody is doing this and then I'm also doing it. You know, I, I remember um, in 2021, this uh, bomb blast that happened. Just 2021, 2001, sorry, around January 2001, where we had this bomb blast, you know, and then um, um, there was this part of Lagos where um, some people just saw some other people jumping um, um, uh, and then they were just jumping and, and following them without asking questions you know and, and that that situation um, explains what happens to so many of us um, when we just follow the bandwagon without even asking questions and say God uh, why um, should I do the thing that that I am even about to do now why do I want to do it ask yourself that simple question why why? Why do I want to do this thing? So for so many people, the things that we do are propelled by what we see other people do. For some other people, it's what you see on social media. It is not because God is giving you clear instruction on what you are supposed to do yourself. That is important. When you have God's revelation, it gives you clarity. It gives you clarity. So why is very important? Clarity. Another thing is that it prevents you from wandering astray. It prevents you um, from dissipating your energy, from dissipating your resources when God has shown you this is what we are supposed to do. This is where you are supposed to go. 
So you know that you can concentrate and focus um, um, your energy and your resources because then you know this is what God wants you to do. Why? We are still on purpose, number one. Why? He said, but when you follow the revelation of the word, when you follow the revelation of the world, purpose also gives you direction. It helps you to know what to follow. It helps you to know what to do because there is a revelation. Then whatever it is you are doing is not based on what others have done or what others are doing. It is based on what God has told me to do. He said, and heaven's bliss fills your soul. That's what happens when you are in the center of God's will. Even when it looks like there's a heavy storm around you, there is bliss for you. There is peace within you. So when, when we look at the life of Jesus, for example, uh, the Bible says that he was there in the boat. He was sleeping and then there was this heavy storm outside. But Jesus knew that no matter what happens, this, uh, this is not the way by which I'm supposed to die. So he knew that no matter how boisterous the storm is, this storm is not going to take me out because this is not what God has shown me. This is not the path that God has shown me. So it was at peace. When you find yourself in the storms of life and you know that you are right in the center of God's will, you can go to bed and sleep even when it looks like there is a heavy storm around you. So what has God said to you? That's a question I want to ask you under this, um, this number one principle today. What has God said to you? If you look through the Bible, we see a lot of people saying things like the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. Now, I'm not saying what the word of Twitter has brought to you, what the word of Instagram has brought to you, what the word of YouTube has brought to you, what the word of your friends. I'm not talking about the word of your friends. What is the word of the Lord to you? Concerning the next step of your life, concerning the next phase of your life, what is God saying to you? Why are you doing what you want to do? Purpose is very important. Purpose is very important. Purpose brings discipline. Another version uh, of, of Proverbs 29, 18, it says, uh, where, there is, where, is there, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. They just live anyhow. Purpose brings discipline. So what is the word of the Lord to you? And I'll say this, when the chips are down and the going gets tough, the best anchor for the soul is the conviction that we are where God wants us to be and we are doing what God wants us to do. Let me take that again. When the chips are down and the going gets tough, the best anchor for the soul is the conviction that we are where God wants us to be and we are doing what God wants us to do. Every other thing out of that will lead into anxiety. I'm telling you, once you know that where I am now is where God wants me to be, and what I am doing now is what God wants me to do, then you are not running after anyone. You're just cool and calm. And like we say, you are collected. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So why? Why do you do the things that you do? What has God said to you about that situation, about that relationship, about that move? What has God said to you? So let's go to the second principle. It's the principle of process. Process. So purpose, we say why. Then for process, we say how. This explains God's personal dealing with each person. God's ways are customized. Yeah, while it is possible to learn from the experience of others, we must also be careful to adapt, adjust, and, and adopt according to what God has shown us. We must learn to be able to adapt whatever we are learning from anyone to what God has shown you, to what God has shown me personally. So the Bible said about Moses that God gave him a pattern on, the, on how he's going to build um, uh, the hack. Every dimension, everything was, was intact. Also, even Noah, God gave him the dimensions of the ark. He knew everything by revelation. So he was able to build according to that pattern. So, how talks about how God wants you, the process. How does God want you to achieve your own goal? Sometimes God will give people the same vision, but their processes may be different. Are we together? Their processes may be different. We must understand that God is a God of process. 
It's a God of process, and uh, it is not something you can do control V, uh, uh, um, uh, um, copy and paste. You can't just do control X, control V, and just say, oh, okay, I'm just going to put this and, and You can't copy process. It is customized. John and Jesus, they were cousins. But John's path <laughs> was different from Jesus' path. Amen. But they were supposed to be family. Jesus could just have followed after, after John and, and, and continued from where John stopped. But no, their paths were different. Their paths were different. So you must understand your own path. Now, let's read a place in the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5 to 6. I will read from NIV. Ecclesiastes 8, 5 to 6 from the New International Version. Let's read some more about process. So the Bible says, whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise art will know the proper time and procedure. Verse 6, for there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by mystery. There is, I will take that verse 6 again, for there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by mystery. So, how do you escape danger? It is for you to understand God's command. He said, whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. Remember, we are talking about how to overcome anxiety. Many of the things that get us into anxious states or that creates anxiety for us, many times they are things that God has not commanded. And because we are not sure of the outcome, because we know that God hasn't said anything, it is just us trying to elbow our ways through life. And once you elbow your way through life, what you get are bruises everywhere <laughs> everywhere bruises so uh, said there is a prop so whoever obeys his command will come to no harm so another thing we need to understand about process is that there is a proper time and procedure for every matter there is a proper time and procedure for every matter for those of us who probably uh, do things in the kitchen, for example, you know that the process for making one food is different from the process for making another food. So for all the things we see around us, you know, of the cameras, uh, the process for making the camera is different from the process of making the rod that is holding the camera. They are two different things. It's different from the process for making those pupils. So God knows what he has created you for and he alone can determine your process. And that is why you cannot do copy and paste. You can't do copy and paste. There is a proper time and procedure. So it says that even though a, man's, a man may be weighed down by mystery, you know how it is when we find ourselves in trouble or when it looks like, um, like oh, uh, the whole thing is going to, is, uh, the whole heaven is going to fall and somebody is saying, hey, uh, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to do this? And all of that. And then we are asking so many questions as if, you know, we are trying to find a way. Out. God will be looking at you and say, hey, uh, bros <laughs> or, or, or lady, you know what? There is a process for it. And you are not going to jump that process. God is not going to jump the process for you. Everybody has to stay within their own process. And when you have passed the, uh, the level where you are, then God can now open the door for you to move to the next level. You know, um, let me share a personal experience. I, I remember uh, um, um, after I left school, went for um, NYC, you know, in my mind I felt, oh, I was just supposed to get, uh, uh, maybe uh, get a job or something, you know. But I was, I was surprised, you know, for, for about five years thereabout, I was stuck in my parents' house. I just couldn't move. I tried everything, I, you know, let me just get a job, let me just get this and that. You know, I was struggling with the process. There was something God wanted me to learn through that process, but I was struggling with it. So I, I, would, I would go out, go do some things, and then by the time I, uh, the, the, the heat comes, I knew that, no, this is not God, and then I'll come back again. So until one day I sat with the word and I was reading, I saw um, uh, Matthew 5 uh, uh, verse 14 to 16 as if I've never read that place before. And it said, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. You cannot be hidden. I said, what? So, but I am hidden in this place. God said, no, you are not, you are not hiding here. I'm not hiding you here. I am making you here. 
So from that time, uh, you know, just to, uh, to, to drive home the fact that I caught something, I went out and bought the map of the world and pasted it on, on the wall in my, in my room then, and then every morning and night, I will be calling all the countries of the world, uh, from, uh, from Armenia to, uh, to Argentina to, uh, to Armenia, uh, you know, to Brazil, to, to, from A to Z, every day I'll be calling it, I'm the light of Armenia, I'm the light of Albania, I'm the light of Argentina, I'm the light of Brazil. I will call it like that every morning and night just to let so at some point even when i am sleeping that thing is already in my subconscious as i cannot be hidden in this place and it was just a matter of time about two years after that something just happened and i knew i caught a principle so uh, there was one of my protégés who had a similar experience. So um, she, a, a lady this time around, so she had this issue. She was always fighting with her parents and all of that. Then I told her something. I said, see, you don't fight a system. You outgrow the system. So I said, look, the, your, the system of uh, the, the, where your family has built, uh, I said, that is a system. You don't fight that system and move forward you outgrow that system. So I told her, I said, just begin to see yourself outside of that place and begin to do things that will take you out of that place. I said, it's a matter of time. And in less than three months, she got a job out of that place and she moved to another part of, of, of the state. It works. Once you understand it, you outgrow the system. It is process. That's what we're talking about. You don't fight a process, you, 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 you allow the process to, to work in you when God has worked. So let, let's read uh, Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23 verse 10. Uh, uh, no, no, Job, sorry. Job 23 verse 10. Job had a similar experience. So um, let, let's look at Job. Let's look at Job. Job 23 verse 10, AMPC. He said, but he knows the way that I take. He has concern for it, appreciate and pays attention to it. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as refined gold, pure and luminous. Pure and luminous. Let's take it again. But he knows the way that I take. He has concern for it, appreciates and pays attention to it. You know what, friend? God knows what you are going through right now. God knows the way you are taking. God is paying attention to every detail. Remember, Jesus said that not one strand of your hair can fall to the ground except your father knows about it. So he knows about what you are going through. There is no need to be uh, to be anxious and, 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 be, and you are worried and, and you allow that the thought of, of of, of that worry to begin to, to begin to make you incapacitated and, and, and immobilized. You shouldn't get to that point. God knows the way. He said, when he has tried me, when he has tested me, you know what? You don't fight a process. You don't fight a system. You outgrow the system. Once you have outgrown that system, the, see, uh, there's this saying I, I, I learned many years ago. I can't even remember who the attribute to right now. He said, the word stepped aside to, uh, to, uh, to let the man pass who knows where he is going. The word stepped aside. I, I, I used to have that quote in my head many years back. You know, the word stepped aside to let the man pass who knows where he is going. So the point is, once you have gone through the process, God will ensure that nature, the universe, will make way for you. So st don't fight the process. Don't fight the process. Somebody should, uh, should put that in the chat room. I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm not going to fight the process anymore. I will stay with God. I will stay in God until it takes me um, through this. Hallelujah. If we must enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God, we must also be ready to abide by the rules of the kingdom. We cannot keep doing things our own way and flashing material words as testimonies of God's faithfulness when we know deep within is all sweat and blood. Many times people come to share testimony. Say, hey, hey, um, uh, I was working in a place and the place was toxic. And then I got another job three months after. That same place where you share testimony becomes toxic. Why? Because you have not outgrown the system. You have not outgrown the process. You have not learned the process. So it is not about the place. It is about the person. Did somebody get that? 
So, uh, uh, so we see uh, so many times people keep running, running from situations, running from people. You don't run, you wait, you grow. That's how God grooms us. So let's read Proverbs 10, 22, the Passion Translation, as I, uh, as I close on principle two. Proverbs 10, 22, the Passion Translation. The Bible says, True enrichment comes from the blessing of the Lord with rest and contentment in knowing that it all comes from Him. When what you share as your testimony is God, there will be rest and there will be contentment. So if you share the testimony, see, you know God has given us capacity as humans. We can think things and just make things happen. The fact that something happens does not mean that God approves of it. You can quote me. <laughs> the fact that something happens does not mean that God approves of it. Right, so rest and contentment. Let me read again Proverbs 10, 22, NIV. It says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. It doesn't mean you are not going to fight for it, but you know that there is peace. Even when you have to fight, there is peace in your heart. That is God. Praise God. So let's move to principle three. Hallelujah. Principle three, professional help and community support. Professional help and community support. This is a question of who. who. So we talked about why, we talked about how. So now we are talking about who. Who are you going with on this journey? Who is in your corner? Who is watching your back? Who is covering your tracks? Who, is ang who do you hang with? Who are you talking to, listening to? Who are you looking up to? Who, 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 who? You should, yeah, you, you know, uh, I'm not a Liverpool fan, but, but I know this has not been the best of seasons for them. Um, they've not started too well. But Liverpool is right in this one. You never walk alone. You never walk alone. So let's see what the Bible says about that. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 12, the New Living Translation. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, you never walk alone is actually in the Bible. All right? Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, New Living Translation. Let's read. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. 11. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Hallelujah. So you must never walk alone. You need to see, when you need to get help, get help. Now, remember the data that I shared earlier, 75% of people, especially in low-income countries, do not seek help. See, seek professional help and pay. See, mental health is the same as having headache. It's the same as having malaria. It's the same as, it is sickness. Sickness is sickness. So the same way you go to a doctor and say, look, the doctor says you have typhoid and you pay for your typhoid. When the doctor uh, diagnoses and says, look, you have a mental health, pay for it. Pay for, for, for therapy, pay. Stop seeking free, free treatment, pay. Are we together, people? Seek professional help and pay. Please help me put it in the chat room. Tell someone, pay, 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 pay. You need to pay. Seek help and pay. Stop looking for free things. Because we think that mental health is nothing as it were. Um, you know, so, uh, and then, you know, most times when you talk to a therapist, they don't give you um, um, analgesic or give you some drugs to take. It is talking. But we don't know that the process of getting you to talk about the thing and, and find um, the root of what caused it and, and then get to uh, get healing, that process requires some expertise. That's why not everybody can do that job. And the people that do it, they have spent a lot of money and time training themselves to be able to understand human emotions. So you should pay. Pay. <laughs> Seek professional help and pay. <laughs> All right. So. 
So uh, let me just try to create a balance here. I know that one of the reasons many people do not seek help uh, is because of the fear of stigmatization, discrimination, and exploitation. You know, uh, um, uh, when people show signs of mental mental issues, sometimes um, they get stigmatized and, and all of that. So I want to encourage that if anybody around you is showing any sign of of, of mental health, please um, um, don't don't label them. Um, don't call them names. Sometimes what they are displaying could look maniac to you as a person, but the truth is you need to help them. The same way when somebody is, is, is high with fever, you rush them to the hospital, that person needs help. What they need is not labeling. What they need um, is not stigmatization. What they need is help. Help them in any way you can. That's why they need your support. So get professional help and community support. You need the, com the community of your friends, the community of your family. You need people. You must never walk alone. Never walk alone. Jesus never walked alone. Paul never walked alone. So who are you to be walking alone? You should never walk alone. So let's go to the fourth principle, and that's um, physical and mental exercise. Physical and mental exercise. So we talked about purpose. We talked about process. We talked about professional help. So number four, let's talk about physical and mental exercise. This talks about where, where your body is a powerhouse. Your body is where all the action takes place. You know, our senior pastor shared a story some time ago. I know he shared it a few times about a particular evangelist, very gifted, very anointed. So, but this evangelist would overwork himself to the point where um, uh, he got so sick that he couldn't even go out to preach to anybody anymore because he didn't take care of his body. So on his dying bed, he said that God gave me a donkey, he gave me a message and a donkey to deliver the message. He said, but I have killed the donkey and therefore, I can no longer deliver the message. Do not kill your donkey. Do not kill your body. You need to take care of your body. Very important. When the body is weak, it affects the mind. <laughs> there is a strong connection between a weak body and a weak mind. Very strong connection. So let's read a few Bible passages that support taking care of the body. All right, so let's go. Ephesians 5.29, I'll be reading the Passion Translation. Ephesians 5.29, the Passion Translation. The Bible says, No one abuses his own body, but pampers it, serving and satisfying its needs. That's exactly what Christ does for his church. No one abuses his own body, but pampers it. Pamper your body. <laughs> you know, I just remember this song. Daddy, where they pamper, daddy, where they bless. Hey, pamper your body. Take care of your body. Are we together? Take care of your body. That's Bible. That's not me. Okay, the Bible says no one abuses his own body. Make sure you take care of your body. When you need to sleep, sleep. When you need to eat, eat. Some people say, hey, I live a fasted life. Be deceiving yourself. <laughs> Even Jesus did not live every day fasting. All right? So, take care of your body. Let's take another one. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46. 1 Corinthians 15, 46, the same Passion Translation. So the Bible says, however, the spiritual didn't come first. The natural precedes the spiritual. So uh, here, uh, uh, Paul was writing about um, the first Adam and the, and the last Adam, talking about um, Adam and Jesus Christ, you know, and then he helped us to understand the fact that the physical comes before the spiritual. So no matter how spiritual you are, with a weak body, you cannot go far. That's the truth. Remember, the man that had a message and he killed the donkey. So once the donkey is gone, everything is gone. So take care of your donkey. Take care of your body. One last one on, on this. One last one on this. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. I'll read again the Passion Translation. 1 Timothy 4 verse 8. The Bible says, For athletic training only benefits you for a short season. 
for athletic training only benefits you for a short season, but righteousness brings lasting benefit in everything. For righteousness contains the promise of life for time and eternity. So we are staying with the first part of that verse. It says, for athletic training only benefits you for a short season. You need those short seasons to keep going. So you do exercise of 30 minutes, for example, it can take you through the whole day for the next 24 hours. Some people say, oh, you don't understand. My work is very stressful. My work is service exercise. It's a lie. Exercise and work, they are not the same thing. They are not. So when you build yourself, when you're doing exercise, the state of your mind is different from when you are working. And so because the state of your mind is also involved in the exercise itself, so they are not the same thing. Creating time to ensure that your body is in shape, that you, 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 you exercise your muscles, exercise your limbs, walk around. Some people just uh, live uh, what they call the sedentary lifestyle. You are just sitting there 24 seven. You are just sitting all through the day. It's just a matter of time before you start complaining, hey, my back, hey, uh, my lower back, hey. Uh, you, everything will just start going, going out of place. So we need to find time to exercise. The least you can do is just walk. Just walk. That doesn't cost much, but it can save your body. Walk, walk around. So let's go to point five as we, as we wrap it up tonight. So point five, so we talked about purpose, right? Purpose um, talks about why, we talked about process, talks about how, we talked about uh, professional help, talking about who, who is going with you, who is in your corner, you must never walk alone. Then we talked about physical and mental exercise. So let's talk about prayer. Let's talk about prayer. All these five principles are important for you to live free of anxiety. So prayer talks about what? What makes everything to gel? What brings your body in alignment with the spirit? What is the plug that guarantees your mental and bodily health? What do you do when life deals you a heavy blow? What do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> I remember this uh, Bunny song I, um, I used to uh, sing with my children. What can I do? What should I do? What should I do when I don't know what I should do? <laughs> All right, so when you don't know what you should do, what are you supposed to do? The question is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? What, what, what? Pray. That's it, pray. It's very simple. When you don't know what to do, you pray. You pray. You pray. You connect with God. You connect with the spirit. You take your eyes and, and your body away from, from, uh, from the obvious and then you go to the spirit and you allow God to minister to you. Let's read Philippians 4, 6 to 7. We'll just take one or two prayer points and then uh, 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 um, um, Bible verses and then we'll pray. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Let's read first from the Passion Translation again. Philippians 4, 6 to 7, the Passion Translation. It says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Verse 7, then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Don't be pulled in different directions. When you see your thoughts going in different directions, hey, how do I do this? Hey, who is going to help me with this? Who is going to help me with that? And you see yourself pulled and pulled and pulled. What will bring everything together, and you know, in one place is prayer. Whenever you find yourself that your energy level is dropping, whenever you realize that it looks like you, uh, 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 like you, you, you just can't get yourself together, it looks like you're having that brain fog and you can't even think clearly, what do you do? Pray. 
Don't allow your mind to be pulled in different directions because once you begin to get bombarded with those thoughts, as you travel with those thoughts, they are going to take you to places that you don't want to be. So how do you ensure that you are where God wants you to be is when you stop those thoughts right there and then you, you, you commit yourself and you pray. Or another form of prayer actually is declaring the word of God, saying the word of God, saying God's promises even when the situation looks contrary, you keep saying the word. You keep declaring the word. You keep saying it. Hallelujah. You keep saying it. He said, then God's wonderful peace, that's the assurance that God is with you. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that you will not have your own, your own fair share of life. But the truth is, when you have God by your side, when you have God in your corner, you know that you can go through it. No matter what happens, God is with you. Hallelujah. God is with you. Praise God. Praise God. So let's read Jeremiah 33 verse 3. Jeremiah 33 verse 3, New Living Translation. It says, Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Prayer. When you pray, God shows you things that you don't know, things that will happen. Pray. That's how you get to the why. Remember, we talked about purpose. So prayer is like taking you back to the beginning and then asking God, so God, I, I know I found myself in this mess right now, but what do I do? I don't even know what I should do. So what should I do? Pray. And as you pray and see God's face, then he begins to show you things that are to come. He begins to show you the way out of the mess that you have found yourself in. God will show you the way if you are patient enough to, to wait on him. He will show you the way. He will. He will. He cannot lie. Psalm 2 verse 8. Psalm 2 verse 8. Again, New Living Translation. He said, only ask and I will give you the nations as your nations. Look at that. God wants to give you nations. You are asking for just uh, uh, the next bread. You are asking for the next meal. But God wants to give you nations. He wants to give you nations. Stop asking for the next meal. Stop asking for just um, something to take care of you and your family. God wants you to help other families. He said, ask of me. Ask of me. Stop looking at your own condition alone. You know, one of the things that, that help us to, to overcome um, ourselves is when we, despite our own situation, despite our own problems, we begin to look and help other people in spite of what we are going through. That's how God begins to show us things. He begins to show us the way. And then I will close with 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and then we'll pray. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, New Living Translation. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Hallelujah. Look at that. So whatever trial you may be going through right now, whatever the temptation may be, know for certainty that God has your best interest at heart and it will make a way for you. God will make a way for you. Somebody say amen to that in the chat room. Just put it, God is making a way for me this season. God is making a way for me. Hallelujah. So we just talked about how you can overcome anxiety. Remember, the, the statistics is glaring us in the face. One in eight persons has some form of mental health disorders. That's about one billion people globally. The statistics is staring us in the face. And out of all the mental health disorders, the most critical is anxiety disorder. About 301 million people live with that annually. You can get yourself out of that statistics when you begin to practice these five things. Remember, purpose. Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Remember, process. If you follow God's process, you will not be pulled in different directions. Remember, seek professional help. God has given some people the wisdom and that capacity to be able to help you. Go and meet them. Stop running away. It's not, um, it's not a crime, it's not a sin uh, uh, to, to, to have mental sickness. It's not a sin. It's like every other sickness. Then get help. 
So the fourth one is physical and mental exercise. You need to exercise yourself, keep your body active and agile. And the fifth one is prayer. You need to pray. So wherever you may be right now, can you just, just walk around wherever you may be? If you can walk around, just pray tonight and say, God, thank you for your word today. Thank you because I know that you have my best interest at heart. Thank you, Lord, because I know that, 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 you, that you are working things out for my good. The Bible says all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God has designed um, uh, your, your life to be, to be a spectacle. God has designed you to be a star. He said you are a city on a hill. You are a city. That is your destiny. That is God's, God's design and God's plans for you. So can you just thank him tonight and say, Lord, thank you for this privilege of, of coming out of this situation. Thank you because I know that you have my best interest at heart and I know that you are working things out for my good. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. I'm grateful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm grateful. Lord, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So can you pray about whatever situation you might have found yourself right now? Can you just begin to pray and say, God, I, I commit this situation to your hands. I commit my life to your hands. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, reign supreme in me. Lord, I release myself to you. Lord, I release. I let go of the pain. I, I let go of, of the hatred. For maybe, maybe it's because someone has hurt you before and, and then you finding it difficult to let go can you just pray and say lord i'm letting go i'm letting go lord i'm letting go lord i'm letting go lord i'm letting go lord lord have your way in me lord have your way lord have your way in me in the name of jesus lord have your way in the name of jesus lord have your way in me in jesus name we have prayed so in Jeremiah 33 verse 3 he said, Ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Ask me. Can you just ask God that Lord show me what do I do in this situation? Lord, I release myself to you today. Lord, show me the way out. Lord, show me your way. Lord, show me your way, oh God. Show me your way, oh God. I release myself to you tonight, Lord. Lord, show me your way. Show me your way, Lord. Show me your way in the name of Jesus. Lord, show me the way out. You said you will show me the way. Lord, I release myself to you, Lord. Lord, show me this way. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Can I pray for someone tonight? Probably you don't even have a relationship with God yet. So everything we're seeing is like, oh, I don't even know what they are talking about. You know, uh, 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 you need to have that relationship. That's where it starts from. That's where you begin to understand the art of God. When you have a relationship with Jesus, can I pray with you today and say, uh, 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 Lord Jesus, I, I just want to have that relationship because I know that once I have it, then my life is fine. Can you just, uh, wherever you may be, can you just uh, put, put your hand on your heart and, and let's pray together and say, Lord, I'm, I'm accepting you to my life. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for everyone joining us from all over the world and for that person that is catching up with the replay of this service. Thank you, Lord, because I know you are sending forth your word to that person. Just say after me, dear Lord, I thank you because you have died and risen for my sake. By reason of your death, you took away every sin and their consequences. And so, Lord, tonight, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for taking away my sins. Thank you for taking away my shame. Thank you for giving me new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Powerful, powerful. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for those who have made this decision again today. I pray, oh God, that Lord, you will keep them steadfast in you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, you will give them this definite encounter that will mark something, uh, uh, that will mark a change in their, in their sojourn in life in the name of Jesus. We give you praise, mighty God. In Jesus' name, amen.